You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. Well, fellow zoo nerds, I finally did it. After five years of you guys begging, I finally made it to the historic Bronx Zoo. And it was, it was okay. You know, it was all right. Yeah, I'm kidding. It definitely lives up to the hype. So what I'm gonna do today is what I would like to do for all zoo tour debuts from now on, is give a breakdown of my visit, some of my opinions, and a few tips on how you can make your visit even better. For starters, getting there. In case you haven't heard, New York is not cheap. Obviously, you have to be willing to spend big no matter what you do. Now, I would be heartbroken if someone said this about my city, but do not stay within a 15 minute radius around the zoo. I didn't really know any better, even though I was warned a hundred times, and I guess it really was convenient to be so close, but if I were to go back, I would spend the extra cash to stay in a nicer area. As for admission, I paid $48.95 for each ticket for two days. Bronx has a few catches when it comes to getting the most out of your experience. You have to fork over a few more bucks to see the Jungle World, Congo, and the Children's Zoo, which I did not visit. So how do you pay for those? Each exhibit has its own ticket kiosk. But if you're like me and you like to avoid any human interaction at zoos at all costs, I did ask around before my visit to see if there was any way you can just buy these add-ons online, but I never got a straight answer. One of the workers asked to see my digital ticket as I was about to enter Jungle World, and it turns out that $48.95 included everything, even though I didn't see the options to not buy them online. Oh well, I would have been a fool to complain about it. Even though there are parking lots, I started in the walk-in only entrance at the Asia Gate, which is the best one if you're getting an Uber or a Lyft to the zoo. I started at 10 a.m. in the middle of June on a Saturday. And the crowd was much smaller than I thought it would be, so much so that I pretty much had Jungle World to myself for a while. It really does live up to what everyone says about it. I have a tough time believing this opened in 1985. Compared to the Asia section in Brookfield Zoo's Tropic World, you can obviously see the difference. I like how enclosed Jungle World makes you feel versus Brookfield and Omaha's rainforests that have a lot of open space. It has a short canopy over you pretty much at all times, which discourages you from looking up at the ceiling or other obvious man-made elements. I love the conservation messages, the signs about their conservation work, the insect displays. Definitely didn't expect to see tree shrews or come this close to a gibbon when they have all this space. Technically, I think it's the smallest of America's mega indoor rainforests, and it's only themed after one continent, but this one is always crowned the best. But they have to stop displaying leopards in this glass box. Clouded leopard? Maybe. I'm pretty sure that was actually the original resident. Bearcat? That's even better. But exhibiting a big cat in such a small space for decades, as far as I'm aware of, is inexcusable for a zoo of this caliber. When I exited Jungle World, I found out why I was the only one in it. The building shares this corner with the Wild Asia Monorail, a nearly two mile ride through and around the most natural parts of the zoo. You don't have to get up. If you do, they stop the monorail. You don't have to look around. You're just given a single sided window and you're always facing the animals. When I first saw the line at 1030 in the morning, it was so long that it actually went past Jungle World. And after being spoiled with Genie Plus, I don't do lines anymore. But so many people say that this is their favorite exhibit in the Bronx, so I figured I'd try it out. I actually rode it twice, and both times I waited about 20 minutes, was told what cab to sit in, and figured I'd enjoy sitting for 20 minutes after what felt like walking for 10 miles. My feelings about this are similar to Disney's Kilimanjaro Safaris. The experience is... eh. I'm not a fan of attractions that give you limited viewing of the animals. It ruins the point of a zoo. Now, from their perspective, these are some of the best habitats you will ever see. Most of them are massive, with the exception of the red pandas, and I could honestly see why people complain about the elephant complex. Other than those, it's definitely an A in my book. I sort of skimmed over the African plains, since by today's standards it's pretty typical. But you appreciate it a lot more when you realize that it was built in 1941, and was one of the first successful attempts by an American zoo to create a natural looking setting for its residents. The overgrown vegetation makes it really hard for you to gauge just how big these actually are. I was really pleased to see hyenas, I had no idea they had them. The Niala family seems to always be expanding, and I didn't expect to run into dwarf mongooses and aardvarks in the giraffe house. The only criticism that I hear from other people is that the giraffes don't have a lot of winter space. 
but who knows if there's more. Overall, African Plains is good, but this is probably the most you will ever see it on this channel. I didn't spend a lot of time here, but I spent way more time of what's to the right of the African Plains. The Baboon, sorry, the Gelato Reserve. It's one nearly acre and a half exhibit for just three species. Nubian Ibex, rare in America. Gelata, pretty sure even rarer in America. And because they are so small, I didn't think that I'd be able to see them, but the rock hyraxes were up front and center. I could have sworn I read complaints on how empty this was, but there was a good number of animals representing all three species. It's really simple in a way, but it's definitely one of Bronx's must-sees, if you ask me. I did a little backtracking and saw images of African forest animals, which meant I was finally about to see the critically acclaimed Congo Gorilla Forest. Exhibits that seem endless, a fallen tree that you can walk through, see through, and it acts as a barrier. And the indoor portion for the guests is a living museum. Some of the displays really do look like a well put together diorama that you'd find at a museum. The terrariums are on the average side if you ask me, but they're still engaging. I work in graphic design and this was my heaven. So many buttons you can press to reveal more information and so many things you could lift. And I'm 99% sure the Python exhibit had a Pepper's Ghost projected screen that simulates how the snake is looking at you through its special vision. If there are any people watching this that make signage for zoos, either take a page out of Bronx's Congo's book or give up. Because you're not topping this level of presentation and education. Not enough zoos have mini movie theaters. Not uneducational 4D theaters. I mean films that inspire. And afterwards, the curtains pulled back and the gorillas were revealed. I haven't seen something like that since like 1999 when the Newport Aquarium in SeaRoad, Ohio did that for their sharks. The same gallery has the world's largest primate sitting right across from the world's smallest monkey. Oh, and the cherry on top. The gorillas can walk right above you and be on your left and your right at the same time. Like I said, it does require a second admission, but if you don't feel like that's fair, the zoo does have a spot to the right of its entrance that lets you see one of the gorilla forests. But I just convinced you that it is in fact worth the $7. With a broken zoom lens, I pretty much just looked past the old pheasant aviaries, which is a shame because there were some pretty interesting birds. Even the massive Flamingo Lagoon was worth more than a few glances. But past that is where the zoo starts to pick up its speed. The Mouse House is the greatest thing I have ever seen in a zoo from this point on forever and ever. Nothing will top this and I am only kind of kidding. Half of it does look like a pet store and the other half looks like a pet store that was closed for the day. So the displays are nothing special, but this is what every zoo is missing. Something so out of the box that it makes someone say, there's no way that's actually a real thing. Rodents and rodent-like creatures obviously get a bad rap. Any issues you might have with them can be set aside in this building. I don't have the exact number on me right now, not only did I not expect to run into 25 plus species, there were so many that I never even knew existed. And I spent more time in here than any other place in the zoo. It would be an A plus in my book if they didn't have those cages outside. But still, do yourself a favor and make sure you do not miss the mouse house. I'm not the brightest when it comes to directions, but I'm a guy so I can't help it. It took me a minute to find the world of reptiles. For the most part, it really is your typical reptile house. Just a bunch of square rectangle boxes down a few hallways. The baby alligator display was cool, but overall, exhibit wise and animal wise, there wasn't really a whole lot that I haven't seen before. Despite this, I spent a lot of time in here appreciating each and every one of our scaly and slimy friends. I also thought it was cool they had a section dedicated to babies, but if you're on a time crunch, some of you might hate me for saying this, but I'd forgive you if you added the world of reptiles to your skip list. All right, uh, land-wise, that was actually technically half the zoo. And that brings us to the center of the zoo, otherwise known as the Zoo Center. It was built in 1907 or 08, I've seen people say both, and it is no doubt the most historical part of the park still in use. It was the original elephant house, but without them, the building kind of looks like a photo opportunity, because who wouldn't want to pose with these and with that in the background? 
the zoo center was actually repurposed for something more appropriate. One side has been taken over by white rhinos, indoor exhibit included, but on the other side is a dragon's lair. Four very impressive displays, four very impressive monitors, and sitting on the throne is the king of all lizards. Turning a pachyderm bedroom into a Komodo dragon setup, now that's something that I haven't seen before. But I still do prefer when they have access to fresh air. I don't know how I ended up finding it. Turns out there are some yards for not only for the Komodo dragon, but for giant tortoises on the zoo center's left side. Just remember, zoo center is a gateway to the rest of the zoo. If you walk through its other side, that means you're now in the Aster Court. It looks like the perfect place to relax, sit down, watch the clouds, and have a nice picnic. But no, the zoo reminds you that this isn't Central Park, and I'm 99% sure I saw signs saying that you're not allowed to even touch the grass. But no matter how much walking you do throughout the day, you're not going to want to sit down on the grass here when there are sea lions around. They've been right in this spot since 1899. I'm going to go out on a flipper and say that this was inspired by Central Park's very own Pinniped Play Party. In case you're interested, the zoo does have an educational keeper encounter to the public. I had footage of it, but of course it's the one clip I did not save on my computer. Anyways, another building zoo enthusiasts love to rave about is the old 1903 carnivore building, later turned into Madagascar. There's a lot of zoo recreations of this African island out there, but like the Congo rainforest, no one does it like the Bronx Zoo. Madagascar is divided into five sections to showcase its diverse environments. I was happy to see a Madagascar exhibit where lemurs were not the stars of my visits. They might be for you, but you know your experience is going to be different when you see ring-tailed lemurs for a few seconds and never again throughout the day. I was more interested in the Nile Crocodile Cave, the room with massive projections of Madagascar's smaller creatures. Not sure what that was about, but it was pretty interesting. But don't let it distract you from something that everyone just walked past. Hiding in these shadows is a mouse lemur. Now, if you can't find it on your visit, chances are they're right in front of you in this hanging hut. You might need $1,000 worth of camera equipment to really get a good look at it, but I think its silhouette is good enough, if you ask me. The spiny forest has a tree crevice that lets hissing cockroaches surround you from three sides. Whoever put this building together must have talked to the Congo team, because the guest side of things was pull this to reveal that overload, which is a good thing. Anything that you can physically interact with automatically makes an exhibit 10 times better. Take notes, exhibit designers. But the building really hits its peak with the ring-tailed mongooses, apparently the only ones in North America. It really made up for the no-show from the FUSA. I didn't even get a glimpse in my 10 or so trips through the building, but that didn't change my positive experience in Madagascar. I know that's a lot, and according to Google Earth's measure thing, we've already walked 2.2 virtual miles, but please hang in there because there's more. Take a left from Madagascar's entrance and the steps will lead you to the Birds of Prey Row. As historic as they look, I'm not a fan of big birds in small cages, because who would, whether they're injured or not. You can knock this down as a skip, especially since it makes you backtrack. But at least the path makes you flock towards another one of my favorites, the Aquatic Birdhouse, that opened way back in 1964. Obviously, things have been updated since, and it probably smells bad now as much as it did back then. But even compared to other birdhouses and indoor exhibits in general, the attention to detail for the most part is unmatched. I mean, just look how lush this recreation of a forest is. Not only do they have puffins, but little blue penguins too. And though I really wouldn't consider them aquatic, there are so few places in America where you can find a kiwi. But wait, there's more. As soon as you walk back outside, you can immerse yourself with even more of those signature smells everyone loves in the Seabird Aviary, a 60 foot high flight cage designed to resemble the Patagonian coast. Turns are flying over your heads. There's poop everywhere and you can't go wrong with more penguins. This aviary is another A plus in my book and I cannot wait to show you it in depth one day. From this point, I backtracked to Madagascar and to the sea lion pool, and I really didn't know what to do from here. So I just went down this path that probably not a lot of people know about to get to my next destination. The world of birds does take an effort and a half to get to, not just because it's kind of far away from any major attractions, but because it has that hill that your grandparents talked about when they went to school. 
all will be forgiven because take what I said about the aquatic birdhouse and apply it to this, but add about 20 or so more compliments. Everything is detailed and it has way more than just birds. There's conservation messages and Bronx was the first or one of the first American zoos to adopt a lighting technique. So you don't even need a barrier to keep the birds inside their homes. This is the best birdhouse I've ever seen and half of it was closed on my visit. So I'd say it's worth the walk. I didn't get a lot of footage of the last few areas, so I will keep them brief. The lower part of the zoo positively gets you lost in the forest. If you head back towards the Asia Gate from this point, you'll meet the Tiger Mountain. A wonderful case of less is more. Two beautiful, massive habitats for Malayan and Amor tigers. Now unfortunately, they were doing the thing that cats like to do best. Tiger Mountain is complemented by an equally amazing yard for Per David's deer a species that is officially extinct in the wild. To continue on with this mountain voyage, one of your last stops might be the Himalayan Highlands. The trail on the left takes you to an open-topped pond where there lurks the white-naped crane. The trail on the right takes you in between the rocks to enhance this Himalayan experience, and immediately you'll be face-to-face -face with a snow leopard. From what I've seen, they really do get the short end of the mountain in zoos when it comes to exhibit quality. But this is the Bronx, so no surprise that they have one of the best of its kind in America. I won't need to tell you to do this, but don't forget about the Red Panda. Going against what I just said, if somehow you're watching this and happen to be a Bronx Zoo executive, it's a nice habitat and all, but give them more climbing space. Please. Last stop is simply known as the Big Bears. One side is the old polar bear rock pit, repurposed for doles. Be lucky if you ever see one because I'm pretty sure you can only see them at now three places in America. Directly on the other side is one of the more interesting enclosures I've seen and it's home to rescued brown bears. If you have trouble finding them, they are located between the cranes and the gelata reserve. And that marks the channel's first full breakdown of a zoo. Almost, because like I said, thanks to time, I didn't pay a visit to the children's zoo or the bison, which is a shame because they quite literally helped reestablish the species out west. The Bronx Zoo opened in 1899, and throughout the century, they've made strides with creating some of the best displays you will ever find in a zoo and constantly putting conservation as a priority, which is why you will always find it near the top of every zoo nerd's top 10 zoos list. Where does it rank on my list? Well, that's a secret for now. All I will say is, if you want to see a proper zoo with minimal flaws, and you don't mind walking the 3.7 miles throughout some hilly terrain, along with everything I said throughout the video, this is the zoo for you. It might sound like there's a lot of walking for a zoo, but it is 265 acres, making it the largest city zoo in America. So you're probably wondering what exhibit will be the first to be featured on this channel. To just spoil things a little, I'll just say that this entire month will be dedicated to the Bronx Zoo. Back-to-back -back features of Jungle World and Wild Asia Monorail. So please stay tuned, stay wild, and thank you for watching Zoo Tours.